Welcome to Roll Call, a 126th Air Refueling Wing podcast of the Illinois Air National Guard at Scott Air Force Base. I'm your host, Technical Sergeant Brian Ellison. The Roll Call podcast focused on people, mission, and community. I want to thank our deployed friends for listening to Roll Call. Coming up, we'll learn about the busy Security Forces Squadron from Chief Master Sergeant Kendrick Henry. The Air Force Inspector General released its report on the findings of an independent review into racial disparity on December 21st. The Chief of Staff for the Air Force, General Charles Q. Brown, and Chief of Space Operations, U.S. Space Force General John Raymond, held a town hall on Zoom the next day. The uh, Air Education and Training Command hosted it on Facebook. You can still find it there. The IG review focused specifically on assessing racial disparity in military discipline processes and personnel development and career opportunities as they pertain to black African-American airmen and and space professionals. General Brown said the Air Force has to do a better job of ensuring operational positions are more diverse. When I was a captain, I did uh, an interview for Air Force Times. And it talked about the percentage of African Americans that were pilots. It was 2%. That was 30 years ago. You know what it is right now? It's still 2%. And there's certain career fields, not only in the Air Force, but other, uh, the other services as well, that those are the, the career fields, most of the operational career fields, that those are the folks that actually raise the price to the top. If you don't put candidates in those career fields, it's harder to actually get them to rise to the top. And if, the shape of the Air Force that it is today. And so you want to make sure that all of us have an opportunity, all the diverse groups have opportunities to be in key positions and compete in those key positions that actually open the aperture for them to rise to the top. And, and that's why in the rated career fields um, for the Air Force, that's our initial focus in some areas, but it's really across the Air Force as well. Uh, one other thing I'm going to add to that is our developmental categories are also going to help us with, uh, you know, how we manage that diversity. Uh, on the officer side, and there's aspects of that on the enlisted side based on how we do uh, their promotions as well. U.S. Space Forces General, General Raymond, he's the Chief of Space Operations, said it's not just pilots and the underrepresentation of people of color that's also an issue. The other thing that we're seeing is in in our business in the Space Force, it's a science, technology, uh, engineering, math, and there's an underrepresentation of, for example, females in STEM uh, career field. So one of the things that we're doing is we build this human capital plan to develop this new service is looking at ways to assess uh, uh, early on uh, uh, and more diverse uh, 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 more diverse workforce in those areas that are traditionally underrepresented. Because as General Brown said, if you look at then how that progresses throughout the career field, uh, out throughout the course of a career, uh, you need to have those folks to be able to to build those into the senior leaders that we need. General Brown says that this report, unlike others, gives leadership insight into the next steps. In military discipline, we're expanding to examine all disparities by race and gender, and we're collecting more comprehensive data. On personal development and career opportunities, we're looking to improve culture, increase diversity, and measure progress. And in the area of trust, when it comes to the IG equal opportunity programs and our commanders. Trust is earned by actions. We can't just talk to talk. We have to walk the walk. We have to ensure our leaders and commanders have the training, experience, authority, accountability, and responsibility to ensure that all of our members can reach their full potential. Now, these changes won't happen overnight, and we will not rush to failure. We'll be open and transparent as we proceed to make meaningful, measurable and sustainable improvements that will endure across the Air Force and the Space Force well after I'm retired and well after many of you have all retired and gone on to uh, other parts of, of your life. To read about the next steps forward, I'll put a link into the description to the uh, full report, which you can find at af.mil. We'll uh, hope to discuss this report findings and what they mean with leadership in an upcoming episode. Coming up after a quick chat with Master Sergeant Heather Wilde of the 126th Air Refueling Wing Recruiting Office, my conversation with Security Forces Squadron Chief Chief Master Sergeant Kendrick Henry. 
Master Sergeant Heather Wildy, 126th Air Refueling Wing Recruiting Flight Chief. What's new in recruiting, ma'am? Hey, sir. Not much. I just wanted to give a shout out to our newest officers here at the 126th Air Refueling Wing. We have Lieutenant Pilosevsky, Lieutenant Burris, and Lieutenant Garza, who have recently graduated from Officer Training School. They are now back here around the wing. And then we also have four new enlistees this month. We've got Staff Sergeant McClinton, we have Staff Sergeant Clark, Senior Airman Collins, and Airman Basic Nelson, who have enlisted in the month of December. All right. Well, congratulations to uh, them. That's a, a great honor, and uh, good luck in their future endeavors here at the wing. What's uh, What do you have uh, for jobs? What's available? So we have a wide variety of jobs available. We have aerospace ground equipment. We have jet propulsion. We have a couple crew chief positions available. We also have civil engineering, um, engineering assistance emergency management positions, a few positions over in logistics within fuels and vehicle maintenance. Um, but my recruiters can definitely help anybody that is looking to find another job or know somebody who's interested in something that we have. And what's a good uh, way to reach you, Master Sergeant Wildy? The best way to reach us is call us on our uh, main line, which is 618-222-5701. Again, that phone number is 618 618- Two 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 five seven zero one, and it rings to all of our cell phones. So somebody will definitely be able to assist. Thank you very much, Master Sergeant Heather Wildy, one twenty sixth Air Refueling Wing, recruiting flight chief. No problem, sir. I'm here today with Security Forces Manager, and dare I say, one of the most popular chiefs in the wing, Chief Master Sergeant Kendrick Henry. Uh, sir, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I'm a fan of your work. I appreciate what you do. Oh, I appreciate it, sir. I appreciate that a lot. So what does the security forces do? I mean, we, we see them, I guess, as cops. There's more to the job than just being cops. Right. Now, I see the, the security forces career field, it's a consolidation, essentially, of three career fields. Um, several years back, we used to be separate. It used to be uh, law enforcement, um, security apprentice, and combat arms. And so right around 1997, uh, the powers to be at headquarters, Air Force consolidated uh, those three into what we know now as security forces. And so it's a combination of combat arms training, uh, weapons training and tactics, uh, your typical law enforcement um, and also uh, force protection, anti-terrorism, and um, infantry tactics as well. So I noticed, like, uh, uh, some of your troops are over at the uh, armory. So you, when you say consolidated, they take the same training, whether they're working in the armory or, uh, or behind, you know, driving a, a patrol car or something like that. Yes, the schools, the schools now are all consolidated into one. Uh, originally, back back many years ago, when I first came in, uh, I came in as law enforcement. There was a particular academy for law enforcement. There was a particular academy for security, and there was also uh, a different tech school um, for combat arms. Now uh, it's rather consolidated. Everyone comes in as a security forces apprentice initially, and then there's a sp- special identification codes for combat arms, which is an additional school after your um, you come back from tech school, and then um, you just go from there. So, you, how long have you been in? Uh, how long have you been uh, security forces? Uh, my entire career, uh, twenty-three years and counting. All right, so you came in. I can't do the math. What is August that, ninety-seven. August ninety-seven. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you've seen the career change. You've seen the career field change. How how has it changed? Uh, it's it's actually evolved. Uh, when I first came in, uh, vast majority of my leadership, my flight chiefs were uh, veterans of, you know, Vietnam and uh, Desert Storm. And so as um, our our mentality and philosophy kind of shifted into a different um, uh, type of war, um, as we went after 9-11 and as we started deploying to uh, places like Iraq and Afghanistan uh, to fight the uh, Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, Um, The war kind of shifted to being more so of a psychological warfare um, instead of just your uh, face-to-face 
uh, type of enemy. Um, and so we had to shift our mindset. We had to shift our tactics, shift, shift our techniques and procedures, uh, and then also adapt and innovate um, to make sure that we were a better and more lethal force when it came to deploying and uh, facing our enemies abroad. What kind of uh, activity do you guys do when you're deployed? Um, it, it ranges from typical law and order, um, also uh, force protection, perimeter defense, um, outside the wire uh, infantry uh, patrols, um, base zone security. Um, a lot of our uh, deployments over the past several years have been, um, we've been uh, integrated with the Army, uh, integrated with the Marine Corps. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's de we've definitely had an opportunity to um, uh, have our footprint in a joint environment. What's that like working with, uh, yeah, working with the other uh, branches? Oh, it, it, it's it's a great experience. Um, I ha I've had the opportunity to work with bo both um, branches of service. Uh, the cultures are, are different. Um, there's definitely some adaptation that needs to uh, um, happen. Uh, but ultimately, we're all there uh, for the same reason, and we come together to uh, accomplish the mission. Let's go back here to uh, Scott Air Force Base. What's your mission here on uh, the base as far as like full, because you guys are here, you have a pretty big presence full time. Yes. Um, uh, my full time staff and first and foremost, I got to give kudos to my full time staff because they're absolute rock stars on what they do day in and day out uh, to maintain um, uh, squadron requirements and accomplish the mission uh, to prepare the wing to support um, the RCP rotations and things of that nature. Um, but what we do is we, Ultimately, we prepare to deploy. We also um, have a, a deep footprint in the support of the uh, nuclear nuclear support mission. Um, and so we continuously train and stay up to date on policies and procedures as for what governs that. Um, we um, fine tune our skills and prepare for training for our drill status guardsmen on the weekends so that they can stay proficient. And at, at, at a moment's notice when we need them and we call them, uh, they can be prepared to uh, rapidly deploy as well. And, but one thing I, ca I can't uh, forget is that uh, our, our stateside mission and how we support the state mission, and that's uh, through domestic operations. Um, and in this pandemic, uh, one thing's for certain that has uh, really tested us uh, because we've uh, had to um, deploy on uh, more than one occasion uh, in support of civil unrest and uh, as well as supporting the COVID-19 efforts. Uh, throughout the state of Illinois. How have you supported uh, the state in COVID-19? Um, well, initially, it, we, have, we have assisted, um, our defenders have assisted with setting up uh, alternate medical uh, facilities um, where the hospitals from in Chicago, Springfield, and Mount Vernon areas have been overcrowded. Uh, we've responded to the civil unrest uh, in regards to um, local events and you know the uh, unfortunate deaths um, throughout the uh, throughout the nation, um, so it's at one point in time, 95 percent of our squadron uh, was, was deployed. Um, whether we were supporting the state mission for COVID-19, civil unrest, and also supporting our RCP abroad in Afghanistan. Wow, what's the RCP stand for? Uh, reserve component period. Okay. Do you guys work with the 370, 375th here? Do you guys, are you guys pretty enmeshed with them? Oh, yes. Uh, the 375th Security Forces Squadron, um, they're, 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 our, they're our comrades and our brothers, um, brother defenders. Um, we, su we support their day-to-day -day mission as far as the law enforcement. Uh, they, they also provide us with a valuable resource um, as far as uh, being uh, the, the active and the host uh, installation. Um, any and every time there's a need, uh, for anything, whether it's they need us for something or we need them for something, uh, the partnership is continuous. Uh, you're the, you're the chief over a squadron with a lot of uh, moving pieces. How do you how do you manage that? Um, well, number one, I rely on my teammates. Um, no one does it by themselves. Um, I have a great group of supervisors, uh, senior NCOs and NCOs. Um, that carry the load day to day, uh, managing their people and managing programs. Um, 
I'm more so of a um, facilitator to help uh, ensure that uh, they're they're equipped with the with the appropriate resources. And my job as a chief at the squadron is just to take care of the people. Um, take care of the people. They take care of the mission uh, day to day, hands down. And so um, it's it helps when you have a great group of individuals that work with you uh, because they tend to make uh, mission accomplishment uh, very easy. Uh, getting get to that, what's your, what's your, uh, your command philosophy, your leadership philosophy? Um, I make efforts to make sure that I am fair, consistent, and um, I tend to hold people it, as long as, as well as myself to a high standard. Um, but most of all, I'll, I'll say fair and consistent, and uh, and also uh, make sure that you know everyone that that I'm surrounded by or that I work with, whether it's security forces or throughout the wing, is that you know number one, you're supposed to make sure that they know you care about them, um, because uh, at the end of the day. Um, your team's supposed to be an extended family. Um, they're not going to go above and beyond um, the call of duty to make sure that the mission is accomplished if they don't know that you know you care about them. And as and as a chief and as a leader, uh, it's very important that uh, leaders have to care about their people and make sure that they're aware of that. What's your uh, what would what's your advice to uh, what's your advice to younger airmen? In the Air Force, maybe as a whole, who oh, are just coming in. One thing, one thing I, I typically say to, to the brand new airmen is to remember first and foremost, um, you're a leader yourself, um, and the first thing, the first job of a leader is to make sure that he or she is a, is an exceptional follower, uh, because your job as a leader is to always learn. Um, you never get to a position to where you're you're uh, above learning. And as an airman in, in the Air Force, the Air National Guard, um, it's important that you find out and fine tune your skills so that you can lead yourself first in the right direction so that one day when that time comes and you're promoting your place uh, in positions of additional responsibility, that um, you can lead others. You can't lead it, you, can, you can't lead others until you can first lead yourself. And uh, in order to do that, you have to be a sponge. You have to learn from others and uh, be a good follower as well. How has COVID changed the mission of uh, security forces? It's changed the dynamics um, because, you know, it's, number one, law enforcement. Um, a lot of it is we're blue collar, we're hands on. And, and, and so when you include a pandemic to where a virus is uh, contagious, based on a lack of social distancing and um, can be transmitted, you know, within close distances and, and by touch. Right. Um, it, it, we have to become um, creative in how we can uh, still execute the mission, find a balance of keeping our defenders safe, um, while at the same time, um, as I said, taking care of the day-to-day -day mission. It's been challenging. Um, but at the same time, um, our defenders have um, never hesitated to answer the call when we call them. Um, no matter what, when they were deployed in Chicago and surrounded by thousands and thousands of people, um, you know, supporting the civil unrest, um, we didn't get any complaints, zero hesitation from them. Um, and they went out and they did the job bravely and courageously. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of, of our team. What's that like to be in a civil disturbance when there's a lot of people upset and, and, and you know, how do you keep your cool? Well, well first, first and foremost, and one of the things that um, my team did a, an exceptionally good job at is that they didn't forget that, you know, these are American citizens. Uh, these are our people. These are our neighbors. These are, these are our store owners. These are... You know our, our our brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and and, and number one and number two is it's their God given right uh, to protest uh, peacefully as they see fit, and um, it all goes back to uh, treating each other as human beings and and not necessarily having an overtly aggressive presence. Um, everyone knows that 
that you have a job to do. And one thing that worked to our benefit is that our defenders went up to Chicago and, and they went there and they treated everyone as human beings. And you, you'd be surprised on how the tone of the protesters shifted uh, because when they were faced with the military presence, uh, hey, as long as they're treated, being treated as human beings and civil, uh, they, were, they, they reciprocated that uh, behavior as well. That must be a nice, nice feeling to, to know that there's some tension there, but you're still respected. Yes, absolutely. What was your role during, during that? Um, dur- as, as a chief, a lot of times you're, 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 you're stuck in the rear with the gear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that but, something that's kind of frustrating that oh, you want to be up there? Uh, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, if I had my choice in it, I'd be in the front lines with, with, um, with, with, with my team my teammates each and every time but um i understand that my job ultimately is to make sure they're trained and equipped they have all the necessary resources and equipment that they need to go down and um also um, um so that when they go there they're well equipped they can do the job safely um, they have the equipment to keep themselves safe and and and, and the american people safe as well um, I was assigned to the Wing Control Center during the pandemic this year, and so um, I, I got to see it from a more of a 15,000-foot view from a wing, wing, wing commander's perspective and a state perspective, uh, which, uh, was, which was a great opportunity as well. I got to see the, how the moving pieces affect the wing and the state as a whole. Yeah, being, not, you know, being a, a chief master sergeant, you're with the commander. How has that changed your perspective on what the squadron uh, is doing? Well, it it honestly it did, it didn't becoming a chief didn't necessarily change the perspective um, for me because I had a lot of great leaders um, uh, before me that kind of planted the seed on what I need to be thinking about before I assume the position. Um, it's all about the commander's intent, and uh, although we're a squadron, um, our our intent fall, falls in lines with the wing commander's intent who, who ultimately falls in line with the governor's intent for the state of Illinois. And so it's, it's important for us to be educated and informed on what's expected of us uh, from the big picture and how our role down at the uh, tactical level, um, pl- what, how it plays all the way up, up the lines to the, uh, to the, 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 the uh, state priorities and all the way up to the president's national security strategy. Why did you uh, Why did you join the National Guard? I joined the National. I, honestly, um, I was I was a teenager, and my grandfather, um, he was a uh, World War II veteran oh, cool. um, as well, and um, served in the Army. Later, transitioned to the Army Air Corps. Nice. And then um, he he ultimately retired a tech sergeant in the in the Air Force in his early stages. Um, and didn't find out until several years, probably about 21 years into my career, that he was a defender also. And oh, so, really? uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of awesome. But uh, ultimately, um, I joined because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be a part of something that was um, um, more than myself. Um, I wanted to help, help others. Um, and so I, I saw the, uh, the position of, uh, at the time, it was law enforcement apprentice, security police. Um, I wanted to um, do be a part of something that was to better my community. Um, I was originally from the south side of Chicago, uh, and um, I wanted to do be a part of something greater than myself. And the uh, the Air National Guard was it was absolutely that. Um, it, it afforded me opportunities to travel you know, thirteen different countries to date. Wow! Um, um, several deployments which I love each and every, every single one of them for their experiences. And I also got to meet um, tons, a lot of great people, which I'll cherish those relationships for the rest of my life. Why'd you choose? So you're from, the, let me ask you this. Let's, you're from the South Side. Yes. White Sox fan? Born White Sox, but I'm a Cubs fan. Oh! <laughs> what? Ah. <laughs> oh. I, that, that hurts. Sir. Not, not, now that I no longer live in Chicago, I, I love the Cubs and the Sox. Oh, uh, okay. Well, both. see, now I'm a Sox fan. I, okay. I, when I was growing up from you know from St. Louis, uh, mm-hmm. because we're crazy about baseball, all my friends said you have to have an American League team. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Chicago was my favorite city outside of St. Louis, so I was like, the White Sox, got to be the White Sox. So okay. I've been a White Sox fan since like the mid '80s. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they Carlton Fisk. Oh yeah, oh, Carlton. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It just uh, a great team. I mean, Frank Thomas coming up mm-hmm. as a rookie. I remember that. Yep, yep. And then uh, just so many great players there. And uh, I lived up in Chicago, and man, I got to go to a lot of. I went to a lot of Sox games. Mm-hmm. It was nice. Yeah, my grandfather took me to more Cubs games. That's how I was introduced to Wrigleyville. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a schlep up to the north side, too, on the red line all the way yep. up. Mm-hmm. It's like, man. Yep. That's too bad, sir. I hate to hear that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so are there any positions uh, available for full-time or DSG uh, side of uh, – for security forces? Uh, we, we do have positions open um, on the DSG side, definitely. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested, they could definitely just contact the recruiting section. Um, they'll, they'll point them right in, in the right direction. Um, and, and on the full-time side, um, we currently do not have any vacancies. Why did you join the 126th Air Refueling Wing? Um, the 126th was uh, actually... a near originally near chicago it was before they they made the relocation um to scott air force base um i was making a decision um whether or not to go active duty or guard um but i i have to say at the time um the decision fell on the recruiter um and at the time it was technical at the time it was technical sergeant curtis tom curtis thompson um, he's a retired senior now, okay. and um, the, the way he just he explained to me um, what the Air National Guard could provide at the time I was a 17-year-old kid, uh, didn't necessarily know which direction I wanted to go, uh, but just sitting, sitting down with him time and time and his patience and, and everything, he kind of he sealed the deal for me. Um, he actually gave me some time to think about it, didn't pressure me. And then I ultimately made the call and told him, hey, I want to do it. And he was like, all right, come on. <laughs> what, uh, so you took care, I mean, obviously you're a chief. You took care of, you, you uh, took the education benefits. Yes. What did uh, yes. you major in? Or? Um, uh, management uh, with emphasis in human resources. What advice do you have for airmen who are looking to get promoted and maybe become a chief someday? I would say it, it starts from day one when you walk in the door. Your, your, first, your first impression, um, how you portray yourself, you are your own brand. Um, you have to brand yourself right away in a, po- in a positive manner. Um, you come in, you hit the ground running, and have an understanding that uh, I'm here to learn and look around you and take the good, bad from each and every one of your leaders and, and, and peers and use that to your advantage. Um, be diligent and be consistent in your duties um, and, and the right people will see it and hard work never goes unrecognized. Um, you, you will ultimately achieve your goals and maybe beyond your own expectations. Who's somebody that you looked up to uh Maybe you saw as a mentor when you were coming up through the ranks. Um, well, my actually my predecessor, um, and I, I thanked him at my um, at my promotion ceremony. Uh, Chief Jersey Rosner, um, he was he was one that um, when I was trying to look at, you know, how am I going to maneuver and navigate to uh, try to make myself known, um, other than just you know the typical day to day doing the day to day. Duties. Uh, he gave me my first opportunity on the administrative side, um, uh, working pl- uh, security forces plans, and uh, I'll be forever grateful for him to that because it gave an op- gave me an opportunity to be se- for my work to be seen um, at the se- senior enlisted level. The op superintendent and the chief um, knew that okay, this this that I did the work that he presented. And then it just afforded uh, different opportunities as well. Uh, but I've, I've come across uh, a lot of great mentors in my career. Uh, just to name two, two additional. Uh, chief Jennifer Kersey, she was my chief when I was deployed um, in Afghanistan. Uh, probably one of the greatest chiefs I ever come across. Uh, she was a leader's leader. Uh, and, and she was a defender to the heart. Um, and also... Uh, 
Chief Chief um, Fitzroy Howe, who just recently retired. Um, those those three chiefs, uh, I, I can honestly say, had a huge impact uh, in my career. For number one, giving me opportunities and not being afraid to uh, spend time with me, um, kind of smoothing those rough edges and and kind of giving me the guidance that I needed to uh, look forward um, in, in in the future direction. Do the uh, chiefs in the wing uh, meet together and discuss things that are uh, going on in the wing as a whole? Yeah, we actually it's it's it's, it's uh, we we do that both at the wing level and the installation level. Um, um, as far as the wing goes, the 126 Era Filler Wing has their own chiefs group, uh, where I currently uh, sit as the vice president. Uh, we 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 meet uh, on the. Um, typically every other month to talk about uh, senior enlisted issues and how we can better mentor and uh, develop the enlisted force. And um, we also do that as, at an installation level, um, which is the Scott Chiefs group, which I um, serve as the president. And, um, we, and it's a consolidation of active duty guard and reserve chiefs. And when we get together to discuss the same issues as far as how we can um, better develop our enlisted force. And it just, it, it, it allows you an opportunity to sit down um, with different chiefs, um, your peers, but there's, um, every, every chief has a story and every chief has a, has a different level of experience and you can learn from each other just, just through simple conversations. Uh, when you raise a question and you, you talk about, um, you, you raise a question in a room, chiefs like to talk. <laughs> 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 so you so you provide an atmosphere where you get a bunch of chiefs where we can talk and uh it's open for them to voice their own opinions then uh you're 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 in for for a nice conversation but the beauty of it is i i, I often like to sit back and just and just listen and I, because as, as i said it every, every chief has their own experience and a different perspective and that that's just, that's just the beauty of being surrounded about because this is all coming from the top one percent of the enlisted force and you'd be surprised of of what you will learn just by sitting back and just listening and then providing your own input and so yes it, we do absolutely do um ha have an opportunity where we get together what issues uh, do you see uh, for maybe not only senior enlisted but the the lower enlisted and maybe and maybe uh, it's different for the traditional guardsmen who you know only come in once a once a month. Well, between I say between full time and, and the uh, drill status guardsmen, um, we just have to have an understanding that um, for full timers, the military is this is our, our lifestyle. You know, every, every day we wake up and we put on a uniform. And so it's a constant reminder uh, of, of the oath, uh, the enlisted oath that we took. And, and so for, for drill status guardsmen, they're, they're, and, I, and I compliment them on, um, constantly because they have to, they have to balance um, their civilian profession as well as their military profession. And just because you're a cop in the Air National Guard doesn't necessarily mean you're a cop in the civilian world. Um, you, you may have someone who's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but is a staff sergeant in a security forces squadron just because they want to serve in that capacity. And that's the, that's, that's the beauty of it. But we can never forget that drill status guardsmen are here. Not, Naturally, a lot of them come for the educational benefits, but they come because they want to be here. And that's the beauty of the Air National Guard, and that's one thing that I constantly remind uh, my, um, my counterparts and the other um, components of the service is that the Air National Guard, they're here because they want to. They're here day to day because they want to, they want to be, um, because it, it requires an additional sacrifice um, balancing two careers at the same time. What's it like to, uh, how do you juggle that with, how do you juggle that with, as a manager, security forces manager, how do you juggle that with uh, your uh, uh, traditional guardsmen versus your full-time guardsmen? Is there, I, you know what I mean? I, it, it, it's, it, it's not necessarily a, um, a balance because we've, um, 
through innovation and technology, we, we've helped to try to um, provide a vehicle to where we're in constant communication with them. You know, the social media sites and apps like GroupMe and things like that. And so uh, instead of us just um, sending um, emails and hoping that they get them, we may send out notifications to them via GroupMe. And actually, once you, you get an entire squadron on one uh, social media site, you know, there, there, there's the official form of communication and then there's the unofficial form of communication, which is good for morale and welfare. <laughs> and it actually keeps me laughing uh, sometimes as well. Um, but, um, you know, we, ju- we just try to do our best to, um, even though they're, they're not here 29 days out of the month, uh, we try to create opportunities to make sure to keep them connected. And it's important to just to uh, keep, keep our drill status guardsmen connected to the unit when they're outside. And, and, and you know, not just on the holidays and when they're here for UTAs, but uh, throughout the week and the month as well. How do you balance your family life? Because it seems, I mean, I was full-time Army, and now I'm a guardsman uh, who's full-time, and it just seems like a different balance when you're like, home home mm-hmm. how, do, how do you balance your your family and your work life um you, you you have to find out ways to uh when to cut it off because the work is always going to be there um you'll never complete all of the work um there just has to be a balance um you put forth 100 percent effort towards completing what you what you can um, and then there comes a time, uh, I like to look at it as there's a thing called a, a tool called a, a masonry tool called a 24 inch gauge. Okay. And, and I kind of line that up into the, the, the uh, hours in the day and you have to divide it up into, you know, there's time for work, there's time for rest and there's time for, you know, the family. And, 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 and so, uh, you have to, uh, just kind of divide it up and, you know, okay, I'm going to apply this much time to, you know, the day-to-day work, the job, the military, and then there's also time for self-improvement. There's also time for, for uh, your family and making sure that their needs are met. And then there's also a time where you, gotta, where you actually have to rest and recharge. And you have to divide that up equally and, and, and with your 24-inch gauging, your 24 hours of the day, um, ultimately, because if you don't, then eventually one of those um, – one, one of those will suffer. What do you do for self-improvement? Because it seems like you're a chief. You might as well just, you're, you're good. You graduated. Oh, no. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> as, a chief, as a chief, you're only halfway there. You're only halfway there. Um, I constantly, um, you constantly have to look at um, things for self-improvement. There, there's additional PME opportunities for um, for uh, Chiefs, I just finished the uh, Chiefs leadership course, um, and that, that that was good, and it gave me a huge perspective at, at the uh, senior executive level as far as the Air Force. Um, I, I read um, a lot of uh, audio books, um, taking advantages of uh, the education benefits, uh, continuously seeking that, um, and uh, also just looking at opportunities to uh, sponge um, leadership workshops um, and reading uh, books. One of my favorite authors is John Maxwell. And so um, I continuously just um, try to better myself um, all the time. What books are those, uh, John? I, 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 I kind of know them, but I can't remember mm-hmm. the name of the books. Uh, I'll say two of my favorites are The uh, 360 Degree Leader and uh, The Five Levels of Leadership. Um, the Five Levels of Leadership um, is probably my absolute favorite. What does that deal with? Uh, because it, it actually uh, talks to you about the, the uh, he, he, he divides it up into five levels. Okay. So where each and every one of your, um, your teammates, um, no matter what, based on your relationship, they're at one of those levels. And, you, and, and you'll be able to identify, and it gives you a base and a starting point on where you need to go go from as far as being 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 a leader, being their leader, um, because uh, ultimately le- leadership is all about developing relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, the bottom level is, is is typically it talks about the position, the position. Okay, um, I was afforded the position. I'm an E9. I'm I'm, I'm the security forces manager. That's that's the uh, 
that's the position that I currently hold. Now I could go around just bossing everybody around and being a dictator, but the amount of results that I'm that I'm going to get with my team, if that's the only thing that I'm using, is going to be minimal. But it, it also just talks about okay, um, they follow you because they because they have to because of the position, and then they follow you because they want to because of the relationships, and then they follow you because of what you do for the organization. And they follow you because of what you do for others. And then they, ultimately they follow you because of who you are and, and what you represent. And, and so with the, based on those, uh, it, it is, it's some more information um, as far as the five levels that, go into, that you can go into. But um, it, is, it always, no matter what, and I've read that book probably about 12 times. Wow. Um, every single one of my teammates, I know what level I'm at. When it comes to them, and uh, and it, it's a, a a silent voice in the back of my head is when we're interacting, we're talking. I'm like, all right, I'm at level one with them. I got work to do. All right, I'm at level two with them. Okay, I still got work. I'm at level three. Okay, we've been doing some time. Still got work to do, et cetera, et cetera. How do you make sure you know all the airmen? Okay, well, first and foremost, prior to COVID nineteen, um, we have a formation in the morning. Uh, and it's called Security Forces Guard Mount. And that's kind of like your typical roll call. Everyone right. comes together, and we're kind of standing in formation. People are spaced out. And so one of the first things that I always do first thing in the morning is I go to each and every airman, and I shake their hands and ask them how they're doing. And, and so regardless of um, how busy the UTA, I've gone to every single member of my unit, looked them in the face, and actually shook their hand, had some type of interaction with them, and, and, and just to see how they're doing. And uh, throughout the UTAs, you just got to make the time. As, as, as chiefs, it's easy to say, well, I'm a chief and I got all this stuff going on and I just don't have time to talk to my troops or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, we can always make those excuses, but you just got to make it important because the airmen with a capital A, they want to see their chief. They want to see the leaders of their squadron and they want to get to know them. Um, now, naturally, you may not necessarily have the opportunity to go sit there and have a, um, ultimately a casual conversation, but in lieu of, in passing, um, I make every effort to ask them how they're doing, um, and I also pay attention to what it is that they're, they're telling me. Like I can go to one of my, one of my airmen, staff sergeants, and tech sergeants uh, from UTA to UTA, and I know what classes they're enrolled in, and I know what challenges they're, if they're having marital problems or if they just started a new job somewhere. And so it, it, it's, it's, um, when it comes time for drill, what I'm doing is I'm, it's more of a check-in for me. Hey, how are you doing? And a lot of times I get a surprise face because they, uh, they're surprised that I remember um, sure, but um, it's you just have to make it important. You have to make it important to know your people as a leader in the squadron and, and throughout the wing and just period in the military. You have to make it a priority to get to know your people. And the more you get to know your people, the the better you can develop the philosophy on what's the best way to lead them, because you can't lead any and every everyone the same way. Every single person you have to lead it, you have to lead differently. There's going to be some people you can say, "Hey, I need you to go um, take care of this assignment." With little, with little uh, follow up, they're going to go take care of it. It's going to get done. Um, and there's going to be others you're going to have to give them some um, more additional guidance and kind of help carry them along the way, uh, with, with giving them steps. You know, go left, go right, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, you still want to get them there. How long have you been uh, full time with the guard? Uh, all but six months. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> what did you do before? I guess you were in high school or something bef yeah. before high, that. High school, basic tech school. Um, came back for a UTA. Jumped on a temp tour. Uh, temp tour ended. Had to do a couple of UTAs. Um, as a DSG, and then a, um, a AGR position uh, opened up. I applied for it, and I got it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So Chief Williams just came through, the, uh, mm -hmm. the chief of the Air National Guard. Yes. And he talked about beards for the men. What do you think about that? 
I think that um, in regards to ultimately, uh, regardless of how we modify and evolved in our um, dress and appearance standards, um, just a, a level of professionalism just needs to be maintained. Um, corporate America allows it. Yeah. And, and so and so uh, senior executives have have beards and um, they walk in the office and they 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 lead they lead an organization of thousands of people. And, um, you know, if you go back into the history of, of the military force, oh, yeah. um, you know, they were allowed um, in, in, in certain countries and it was actually a uh, symbol of strength uh, for, for um, a lot of uh, different uh, militaries. And so I think regardless on how we evolved, uh, uh, how we evolved is in regards to um, dress and appearance, um, as long as we maintain a professionalism, um, we'd be fine with it. What have you heard? Like anything about the regulation? Like what's the? They're gonna are they gonna mandate a uh, length? Um, I have not, um, and so I, I would anticipate that it would. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> because, because you know how how, how we can be as people. Um, if if you, you you don't hold us to a standard, we'll, we'll definitely test it. <laughs> Couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to make the move down from Chicago to here? I bought into the unit, and I had a sense of ownership. Um, probably after the first week, I was in I was in the, in, in the squadron. Um, I knew then that I wanted to make it a career, and so when I when I was told that uh, we were relocating, I said, "Okay, fine." Um, it, 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 there was no hesitation. It wasn't that. I, um, it wasn't a thought of, oh, what am I going to do? I'm leaving my hometown. Um, it was more of, okay, it's what's best for the unit. Uh, the unit needs people to move down to relocate. So, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, I consider the 126 as, a, um, as an extended family. Um, and, and so it, it, it was an easy decision to come down. Anything else to add, Chief? I think uh, I've kept you long enough. Oh, no, no. Ultimately, i um, just... Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here um, and, and just just to speak. Um, um, I've enjoyed my time here in, in the Air National Guard in the 126. Um, it's been one of the best life decisions that I've made. Uh, the opportunities that I've had, um, I don't take for granted and I don't take lightly. And um, yeah, over ultimately, uh, just thank you. All right, Chief. Thanks for uh, joining me today. That's uh, the Security Forces Manager, Chief Master Sergeant Kendrick Henry. Again, sir, thanks for coming in. Thank you. I love to hear about this move from Chicago to uh, Scott Air Force Base. It, I don't know. It, for some reason, just the, the history of it fascinates me. And one, one day, I want to do just a podcast on just the move from, uh, from, from Chicago down here to Scott Air Force Base. According to the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, the 7th Annual Air Force Trials 2021 is going fully virtual. Air Force Trials is an adaptive multi-sport competition open for all wounded warriors enrolled in the AFW-2 program and will take place April 9th through the 17th with the actual competitions occurring between April 12th and the 16th. For updates and information on the Air Force trials, you can uh, look up woundedwarrior.af.mil. The combined federal campaign is going on now through January 15th. CFC is the world's largest and most successful annual workplace charity campaign with almost 200 CFC campaigns throughout the country and overseas raising millions of dollars each year. Pledges by federal, civilian, postal, and military donors during the campaign season will support eligible nonprofit organizations that provide health and human benefits throughout the world. Don't forget to check us out on social media, including our YouTube page. Need some more, some more subscribers and likes on that. You can find all of our links to our webpage and YouTube at link.tr.ee forward slash 
A-R-W. I'll put our link tree in the description. If you are uh, watching on Facebook or Instagram, don't forget you can also download this on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening to Roll Call, a 126th Air Refueling Wing podcast focused on people, mission, and community. I'm Tech Sergeant Brian Ellison.